Okay guys, Assalamualaikum everyone. I uh, hope you're having a good Saturday. Alhamdulillah, this week now we have reached Ramadan already. Alhamdulillah, I hope um, all of you have a blessed Ramadan. So, uh, welcome back to another series of uh, sacred text series. And today's class is about knowing the path to Allah. Um, this class is based on Sheikh Ibn Arabi Sahih Tijani's uh, Magnum Mopus. And this book is a manual for those on their spiritual journey to Allah, for them to know themselves and to know Allah. And um, this week is the fourth episode. And this class will be conducted by uh, Imam uh, Talut Daud. So let me read a bit of his bio for, for you all. So Imam Talut is a student of knowledge from the United States who has studied Arabic and the religion for over 10 years. He specializes in Arabic translation and the Hanafi fiqh. He currently resides in Mexico where he has taught and served as Imam for the last six years. And he is also a murid and authorized mukaddam of Sheikh Mahi Sisin. So inshallah with that, I would like to um, pass it over to Imam Talut for him to comment the class. Uh, Bismillah Imam Talut, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, before anything, we, we want to uh, wish everyone uh, Ramadan Mubarak, um, a blessed Ramadan. And we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open up the doors to his favors and the door to his, his mercy and forgiveness for everyone. And we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through his infinite mercy and through the blessing of this month, lift the current uh, difficulties that are upon mankind, both Muslim and non-Muslim. And so we're going to begin, inshallah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yawm al-deen. Allahumma sali ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatiha lima ughlika wal-Khatim lima sabaka. Nasir al-Haqi bil-Haqi wal-Hadi ila siratika al-Mustaqim. وَعَلَىٰ آلِهِ حَقَ قَدْرِهِ وَمِقْدَارِهِ الْعَظِيمِ رَبَّنَا أَتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِيْرَىٰ عَذَابِ النَّارِ اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما تعلمنا وزدنا من فضلك علما وتعليما إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم ربنا إنا نسألك فتح, فتح الآرفين اللهم إنا نسألك فتح الآرفين اللهم إنا نسألك فتح الآرفين بسم الله Okay, so we were reading and in, in the book Bogiyat uh, al-Mustafid of Siri uh, al-Arabi ibn Sayh and we had established that there were two types of knowledge there is hidden knowledge. There is, a, you know, apparent knowledge, which is the knowledge of the of the sacred law, and the knowledge of um, and the knowledge that is uh, um, related to the exterior acts or the acts of the body. And then there is hidden knowledge, which, which is the knowledge that is related to the purification of the heart and the heart's journey towards the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so um, then we establish that this hidden knowledge is not something that is outside of the Quran and Sunnah. Rather, it is a result of a person gaining knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah and putting that knowledge into practice. And so as a reward, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives that person knowledge of what is called knowledge of uh, al batin or hidden knowledge or knowledge of the in, inner uh, sciences. And so we're going to continue. Um, and finally, uh, just, just one uh, more recap. We established that the, the scholars of in, uh, hidden knowledge are not different to the scholars of, uh, of apparent knowledge, that they are um, both colleagues in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, the scholars of hidden knowledge 
have um, have been distinguished from their colleagues with knowledge that Allah gave them without that they did not have to study. And all of this is knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah and how to properly put it into practice. So um, we're going to continue, inshallah, and we're going to backtrack a little bit. Uh, uh, and uh, so then he said, then um, uh, Imam al-Sha'rani said, in al yawaqit and the proof of Islam, Al-Ghazali used to say something similar to what Ibn Abdul Salam used to say. But when he met the, Su the Sufis and experienced their path, he started to say, we had been idling our, our entire lives. In other words, we, had, we, we wasted our entire lives. That is due to the knowledge, um, what, what the knowledge on the path of the people of disputation consists of in terms of speaking, more than acting. So he said this because he realized that the, um, the knowledge or of the people, um, uh, of the knowledge of the scholars who do not uh, put it into practice was only knowledge. It, it had no, act, no action behind it. But the reality is that knowledge is only valuable if we put it into practice. So for that reason, he said, we wasted our, our entire lives. But the truth is that one who is occupied with that knowledge, with the knowledge of the scholars, of uh, apparent knowledge, is never idle. Instead, it is the foundation of the path because part of the concern of the people of the path is that the book and the sunnah scrutinize all of their movements and stationary periods but only the one who dives into the depths of the hadith and Quranic exegesis, Quranic explanation really knows this. So it's important to try to gain as much knowledge as possible because only that way do you know that the knowledge of the people of Allah is from the same source as the knowledge of, of, of uh, the people of, the, of exterior sciences. And this saying of Al-Ghazali is only something that emanated from him in his state of passionate love for the path of, of the people. And the ruling of the passionate lover is the same as that of the drunkard. And if he had contemplated his state, he would know that what he said was true. In other words, that uh, compared to what he gained on the path of the people of Allah, you know, it, what he gained on the path of exterior knowledge cannot compare. There's no comparison. So what he said was true in a sense, um, that jurisprudence is the foundation of the path and the upshot of the Su Sufis, um, is that he is none other than a scholar who acts upon his knowledge. The upshot of the Sufi is that the Sufi is a scholar who acts upon his knowledge. And so Ibn al-Arabi bin Zayh, uh, he uh, continues, the texts of the complete masters regarding this issue are clear and their writings contain, containing grand explanations and lofty indications are plentiful. But we have restricted ourselves here to these few that generally enlighten one to recognize the origin of the sciences of the people of the path as well as an indication through some of what they had obtained in this field. However, it has been clarified, and we praise Allah, exhausted as he for that, that the origin of their science is only their acting upon the book and the sunnah according to the rulings uh, and requirements of, his, of the rulings and requirements of Islam, and their loyalty to the orthodox faith until their inner being, radiant divine lights. Uh, until in their inter intervening, radiant divine lights are produced uh, um, from them that uncover them uh, by the permission of Allah. So but the, that uncover by the permission of Allah the hidden secrets of the purified sacred law and the hidden lights of the realities of Irfan. So I'm going to read that again. 
It, it has been clarified, and we praise Allah, exalted is he, for that, that the origin of their sciences is only their acting upon the book and the sunnah according to the rulings and requirements of Islam and their loyalty to the orthodox faith until in their inner, inner beings, radiant divine lights are produced from, uh, from which, uh, which uncover to them by the provision of Allah, the hidden secrets of the purified sacred law and the hidden lights of the realities of the Irfan. Irfan is Gnosis, is direct uh, knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is produced through spiritual experience and not through intellectual um, uh, intellectual inspection or reason. So um, here we have something that, that is very important and that is one, we must have correct aqidah. This is not, so the Sufis build upon correct aqidah. You know, the Sufis don't have corrupt aqidah. And if a Sufi has corrupt aqidah, then his aqidah is attributed to him and the rest of the, the, the Sufis are, are um, completely free of that. So it, we have to build upon the foundations. The foundations of orthodox faith, the foundations of proper aqidah, the foundations of knowledge of the book and the sunnah um, through the, the, the scholars of fiqh and usul. And so we build upon knowledge. We don't build upon, um, or we don't act without knowledge, and we don't uh, act upon knowledge that is not produced through action and which we cannot um, deduce its uh, its origin so basically he's saying that you know um a, a, a lot of people inside is saying that from what we have just read in this section it is really clear or it should be clear to the reader that the origin of the sciences of the people of allah is that they are people who first built their foundation upon uh, correct aqidah and then upon the book, following the, the book and the sunnah closely, and that produced within them the lights that revealed to them the, the hidden uh, knowledge and the hidden realities of Gnosis. Thus, the scholar of inner knowledge is the one who has taken a portion of academic, academic knowledge. Then that academic knowledge led him to act upon his knowledge. And that acting upon his knowledge his acting upon his knowledge provided him with inner knowledge. Thus he became a colleague of the scholars in their sciences. Then he was distinguished from them by additional sciences, which are inner knowledge or hidden knowledge. It is also called inherited knowledge according to the traditional report. And this is a Sahih a Hadith. Whoever acts upon what he knows, Allah will cause him to inherit sciences that he did not know. So, having established that the origin is the uh, the origin of this knowledge is their acting upon, you know, they're gaining knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah and acting upon it. Now he's going to move to the proofs or the evidences that such a knowledge can exist. And so the first one is the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He says that if someone acts upon his knowledge, then Allah will cause him inherit, to inherit knowledge that he did not know. And they're acting upon what they they know only provided them with sciences they that they had not known due to their being more firmly established in the foundation of taqwa and the foundation of conscious awareness and fear of Allah than anyone else. <coughs> Allah, exalted as he has said, and fear Allah, and Allah will teach you. Allah. Fear Allah, and Allah will teach you. And that is from Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, verse 28. So, in, in Shaykh Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi, radiallahu anhu said, in other words, he will teach you, he will teach them what they had not known 
by mediation of the divine sciences. For that reason, he, glorified as he, subhanahu, ascribed the teaching to the name Allah, which points to the divine essence, which gathers within it all of the divine actions, names, and attributes. Then being firmly established on the foundation of taqwa, on the foundation of conscious awareness of Allah, is the staircase by which one ascends to the attainment of the sciences of the great ones, the sciences of the Akabian, and is honored with understanding subtle secrets. Um, Ibn Atta'illah said in al Hikam, how shall the heart shine on whose mirror are stamped the Im images of creation? Or how shall it travel towards Allah when it is weighed down by passionate desires? Or how shall it aspire to enter the presence of Allah when it has not been purified itself from the impurity of its negligence? Or how shall it hope to attain the subtle secrets when it has not been repented from its sin? What he meant was that the comprehension of the subtle secrets is only possible by becoming established in the stations of repent repentance, tawbah. So you have to do tawbah before you can uh, become established in any of the stations of the path, the first of which is tawbah. And secrets only become uh, come after one goes through the, the stations of taqwa. And that is when the secrets start to come. And so he was saying that you can only get to these subtle secrets through repentance. And the station of tawbah is only possible after being firmly established on the foundation of taqwa. Uh, on the foundation of uh, conscious awareness and fear of Allah, outwardly and inwardly, secretly and openly. <laughs> Thus, the people of the path, may Allah be pleased with them all, were first firmly established on the foundation of taqwa. Then they studied the sciences for Allah's sake, followed by acting upon what they knew because of their taqwa. Thus, Allah provided them with rare sciences, subtle indications, and deep understandings, deep understandings that they had not known previously. So they extracted from the speech of Allah, exalted as he, and the speech of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, rare matters and astounding secrets. Therefore, their feet became firmly established in knowledge. And so they... they He's actually um, making allusions here um, to different uh, concepts that are in the Quran. Uh, they be, their feet became firmly established in knowledge. Uh, uh, they became rasi khuna fil ilmi. The rasi khuna fil ilmi. They are uh, mentioned in Surah Ali Imran, and uh, they they are the people who say we believe in all of it. All of it is from Allah. You know, and that is sufficient for them. And, uh, you know, so they, the people of Allah, they first firmly established themselves in taqwa. So they first um, completely fir make firm their foundations and they're in, in following the foundations of knowledge. And so they would have most of them. Um, there are some who didn't study. But most of them would have studied Aqidah, enough Aqidah to keep from making mistakes in Aqidah and studied enough Fiqh to know the Ilm al-Hal or, the, uh, or the, uh, the, the knowledge that is obligatory for them. And then they acted, complete, acted upon that knowledge completely, leaving what they knew to be uh, unlawful and acting upon what they knew Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had, had demanded of them and open and in secret. And, and from there, that was their foundation. And then they, they gained more knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah through study. And this, and then they acted upon that knowledge that they gained through the, through the Quran and Sunnah. And that's how they became uh, completely firmly established in knowledge. And they became people who Allah had taught. Thus, they are the scholars who are firmly established in knowledge. May Allah be pleased with them and allow us to obtain by his pure grace and generosity what he had singled them out with 
I mean, Sheikh Abu Bakr al Wasiti, who said, the, those firmly established in knowledge, the Rasi of al Almi, are those whose spirits, Arwahim, are firmly established in the most hidden realm and the secret of the secret. So the real uh, uh, Al Haq, the real or the truth, glorified and, and exalted as he caused them to know by himself. And he taught them meanings of the verses of the Quran that he had not taught to anyone else. Then he, they, they immersed themselves in the ocean of comprehension seeking increase. So he unveiled to them some of the stored up treasures of meanings that are behind each letter and verse. Then they took the pearls and jewels and spoke with, and spoke with wisdom. Yahya ibn Mu'adh radiallahu anhu said, Ahmed ibn Hanbal and Ahmed ibn Abi al-Hawari Abi al-Hawari met each other. So Ahmed ibn Hanbal said to Ibn al-Hawari, O oh Ahmed, narrate to us something which you heard from your teacher Abu Sulaiman. Ibn al-Hawari said to Ibn, uh, Ibn Hanbal, O oh Ahmed, say subhanallah without showing off. Ibn Hanbal replied subhanallah and elongated it. Then Ibn al Hawari said, I heard Abu Sulaiman say, when the souls have firmly resolved to abandon sins, they fly freely in the spiritual dominion and subtle wisdom returns to the slave without it having to be taught by him, uh, to him by a scholar. Then Ibn Hanbal, Ahmed Ibn Hanbal stood up and sat back down three times and said, I have not heard in Islam any narration that is more astonishing than this. Then he narrated the following hadith, whoever acts upon what he knows, Allah will cause him to inherit sciences that he had not known previously. Then he said to Ibn Abi al-Hawari, you have spoken the truth, O Ahmed, and your sheikh, sheikh has also spoken the truth. So basically this is Ahmed Ibn Hanbal, who he actually, you know, he met with one of the people of the path and, you know, he spoke to them and then he brought out the proof of what they were saying, you know, what they had said from the words of the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is a, a specialty of the people who, uh, who study knowledge and then act upon it and gain hidden knowledge is that they can connect anything that, the, that they or their teachers say to the Quran and Sunnah. And, any, and, and this is where we get um, one of the uh, khalifas of Sheikh Ibrahim Niyas, anhu, whose name was uh, uh, um, uh, Muhammad al-Mishri. He said, um, I seek refuge from Allah, from Gnosis, from Ma'rifah, that is not found in the Quran. And then he, he abruptly said, nay, I seek refuge in Allah, from any Gnosis or Ma'rifa that is not in the Fatiha. And so we, you know, the people of Allah, even though they, they receive secrets and sciences from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are intent upon matching that, that, that knowledge to something from the Quran and Sunnah so that their knowledge will be upon a firm basis. And they are not satisfied with just getting, uh, what we call why did that uh, or inspirations, they want their inspirations to match up with the Quran and Sunnah. Thus, you should know <clears throat> that the sciences which people, which the people of Allah obtain to the exclusivity of others, are, as Sheikh Abu Abdullah Al, -Al Furshi said. Secrets which the real blessed and exalted is he manifests to his trustworthy saints and honored nobles without their hearing it or studying it. Only the elite comes to, to know them. Said, uh, only the elite comes to know them. Said al Kharazi, may Allah have mercy on him, said, The Arifin, the knowers of God, the, the Gnostics, have tre treasures in which they have deposited rare sciences 
and amazing knowledge about which they speak with the tongue of eternity and from and um uh and from which they educate with pre-eternal expressions and that is from unknown knowledge the author of al said his expressions with the tongue of eternity and pre-eternal expressions is an indication that they speak by Allah. What he meant by his expression, and that is, and that is from the, uh, and that is from the unknown knowledge, is that knowledge, uh, is that knowledge where there is no way to need to either understand nor obtain for it, um, for anyone except those who know know by Allah. So it, it's uh, knowledge that is un, um, not obtainable. A not understandable except by the people who are knowers by Allah, the Arifin, or the ulama of Allah, the, the scholars of Allah. And it is, it is this hidden knowledge, this knowledge indicate, it is this knowledge that is indicated in the hadith that Ibn Uyayna, um narrated from Ibn Juraj, from Ata, from Abu Huraira, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Verily among knowledge is a hidden type. Only those who know by Allah recognize it. And when he speaks by it, only the heedless deny it. Among those who clarify that knowledge of the Arifin, uh, um, of the, the knowers of Allah, is what is referred to in this hadith. Um, among those who clarify that the knowledge of the Arifin, the, the Gnostics or the knowers of Allah is, is the knowledge that is referred to in this hadith is the, the Gnostic Ibn Abad al-Rundi. May Allah be pleased with him. He's, he, he wrote uh, one of the earliest, uh, one of the earliest uh, commentaries on the hikam of Ibn Atayullah, Ibn Abad al-Rundi. Uh, and his commentary is very good um, for the people who are seekers. So there is no doubt that the Arifin of Allah, the, the um, knowledge of Allah, are those who have unveiled clear knowledge and that their knowledge is spiritual knowledge after which no ignorance remains, just as darkness does not remain after the rising of the sun. And it is correct knowledge, which it does, which which is inaccessible to corruption or it's um, not, it's not susceptible to corruption because it does not come about by way of contemplation. Sheikh Muhyiddin Ibn al-Arabi um, uh, again said, <clears throat> our knowledge and that of our companions is not by way of contemplation. It is only by means of a divine outpouring. That is because knowledge by way of contemplation is subject to being either corrupt or sound. So in reality, it is supp suppositions and there is no surety in it. And by our companions, I mean to say the people of weighty sayings and witnessing, not the worshipers, nor the ascetics, nor the Sufis in general, rather the accomplished from among them. For that reason, it is said of the sciences of prophecy and sainthood that they are beyond the mounts of the intellect, that they are beyond the the, um, the, tor, the mount, the mountain of the intellect. The intellect has no way to penetrate it. However, it accepts it when it is sound, not being dominated by baseless intellectual skepticism, that being an example of its corrupt conclusions. So basically what Ibn Arabi is saying is, is that um, the knowledge of the Sufis is not through um, is not through intellectual uh, investigations, is not through reason, is through divine outpouring. And the intellect cannot access that knowledge. However, an intellect that is sound, an intellect that is, uh, that is blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept that knowledge because it, it accepts what is sound. Then the name Faqih, the name um, fa the, the name of Faqih, Faqih in general means somebody who um, is a scholar of, of Islamic jurisprudence, scholar of fiqh. But here he's, he's using the word more generally to mean the person 
who has um, accept, has a deep understanding of the religion. And so he says that the name Faqih, a person who has deep understanding of the religion, is more appropriate for this group than any other because, because they call to Allah with insight. Sheikh Muhyiddin and the author of Al Ma'arif both said at the end of the above excerpts, this is knowledge, this knowledge, meaning the knowledge of the Gnostics of Allah, the, the, the knowers of Allah, is fiqh or deep understanding of the religion. And he, uh, meaning Allah, has said, exalted is he, for there should separate from every division of them a group remaining to obtain understanding in their religion and warn their people when they return to them. And this is Surah Tawbah. Thus, this warning was made beneficial through al-fiqh, or deep understanding in the religion. And this warning is really the giving of life to the one who is being warned by the water of knowledge. And so you're, you're, uh, the, the person who is warning is really giving life to a person through the, the water of knowledge. And, and this symbolism is very common in uh, Sufi text, uh, water being knowledge, water being life, um, and things like this. And, and what it means is that the, he, through warning the people, the, the Sufi who warns the people and brings them back to the path gives life to their hearts. And he does so through knowledge that Allah has granted him. So giving life by knowledge is a level of deep understanding or fiqh in the religion. And that fiqh in the religion or deep understanding in the religion became the most complete of its levels and highest of them. And from this were the scholars of inner knowledge, the scholars of hidden knowledge, distinguished from others by their direction, directing to Allah and guiding towards the path that leads to arrival before him. Blessed and exalted is he. Uh, so he continues, uh, the author of Al-Yawaqid Al-Jawahir, meaning Imam al-Sha'rani, uh, mentioned in it that the scholars of inner knowledge, the scholars of hidden knowledge, were distinguished from others by their knowledge of the path that leads to acting upon the book and the sunnah. He said, if you were to say, for example, my goal is to abstain from the world to the point that no habitual inclination towards it remains in me. They would say to you, do plenty of remembrance of Allah exalted is he day and night until your veil becomes thin and you will be perceived the hereafter with the eye of your insight. And you will look upon what stations in bliss belong to the one who abstains from this world. And when you have seen that, you will undoubtedly abstain from the world. And if all of mankind were to say to you, seek the world, you would not obey them. But if you were to say that to a scholar, meaning a scholar of who only has um, apparent or outward knowledge, he would say to you, Allah commanded you to abstain, abstain so abstain. And he would not be able to guide you to the path that leads to that. So his situation is the same as that of a doctor who has memorized a book of cures, but does not know the method of removing illness with them. And so this this is a, this is kind of a, a culmination of what we what we've been saying, is that you know hidden knowledge is granted to people, and hidden knowledge is um, is really and truly. Uh, intimate knowledge of how to put the Quran and Sunnah in practice. And so where Allah says to you, abstain from the world, the people of hidden knowledge can lead you to that. Where Allah says to you um, to, uh, to uh, fear him, you know, openly in secret, the people of inner knowledge can lead you to that. For, so all of these things that the Quran and Sunnah um, dictate, besides just uh, regular rulings, what the 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 um, deep 
spiritual guidance that is that is buried in the Quran and Sunnah, the people of hidden knowledge, the people, the Sufis, the people who, who gain this hidden knowledge can lead you to that. And that's what it, that's what is the hidden knowledge is knowledge, intimate knowledge of how to put the Quran and Sunnah in practice. And what also distinguishes the scholars of inner knowledge from others is their knowing the diseases of the heart, their number and different types and the different levels of the soul, as well as their knowing their cures in general and in detail. Also included in that is their knowledge of the etiquettes of the presences of the real, of, uh, of the presences of Al-Haq, the truth, mighty and exalted is he, on, um, of, in the realm of legal obligations and all of the stations of the religion. For each of these stations has exclusive etiquettes on the path and only the scholars of inner knowledge know the way that leads to act of, acting upon these etiquettes. And inshallah, um, Sidi al Arabi Mensai and later and later um, sections of this muqaddimah, this introduction, um, which I always say is, is really and truly a separate book. Um, it's a separate volume that can be studied and understood apart from what, uh, what is in uh, the rest of the book. But the, in the other sections, uh, a lot of Ibn Sayyid, may Allah be pleased with him, is going to teach us some of these etiquettes that he is alluding to here. And I, I, I'm gonna finish with this uh, last uh, section because it, it, well, I'm gonna finish this section because it, it's, we're almost to the end of this section. Um, the Sheikh and Noah of Allah, exalted as he, Sidi Abdul Wahhab al-Sha'rani, may Allah be pleased with him, said in his At-Tabaqat, Sidi Ali ibn Sidi Muhammad al-Wafa used to say, from the jurist, you will benefit from, from the call to know the rulings of the religion. But from the scholars who act upon their knowledge, you will benefit from acting upon the rulings of the religion then look to which of the two benefits is closer to the Lord of the worlds and hold, um, and hold on to that. And if the jurist asks you what benefit you received from the true Sufis, tell them I learned from them the best way to act upon the rulings and traditions of the religion, uh, of the religion that I learned from you. So it's not, um, don't be disrespectful and tell them that you know, they expanded upon upon the knowledge that we got from the jurists. And and this is uh, uh, this uh, what uh, Sidi um, Ali bin Muhammad uh, al-Wafa said is basically what we've been saying. Also the biography of the aforementioned Sheikh Sidi uh, Ali in the biography of the aforementioned Sheikh Sidi Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, he mentions just as the scholars of inner knowledge were distinguished with knowledge of the way that leads to acting upon the sacred law inwardly and outwardly in the realm of dealings, likewise they were distinguished as something others have no share in, sciences of the which are the sciences of the of divine knowledge and unique realities in the realm of unveiling and benevolent witnessing, because they obtained the knowledge of divine oneness that is specially reserved for the special elite who are complete by way of real, of the real unveiling and witness witnessing with their eyes. This is the knowledge that we mentioned above as being named knowledge of unveiling. Since the one who possesses it uncovers knowledge of Allah, exalted as he, his beautiful names and his exalted attributes that are inaccessible to the mind and unintelligible through speech. And it is the highest of the levels of belief because belief is either through imitation, reason, or unveiling and witnessing. The first, or in other words, uh, the first or uh, imitation is the be belief of the masses. The second and uh, reason is the belief of the scholars of outer of the outer outward sciences who are incapable of the level of the people of Gnostic experience. And the last is the belief of the knowers of Allah exalted is he. 
And as was mentioned before, this knowledge is the second type of inner knowledge, and it is the proceeds or the result of the first type of inner knowledge, which is the science of right action inwardly and outwardly, just as the science of right action is the proceeds or the result of outer knowledge. Then the source of the sciences of the people of perfection should have become clear to you, and you should have perceived some of what the what secrets and experiences we allude to alluded to by way of summary and Allah exalted as he is praised for that so that that brings to the end the first part of the set that section and there's only a couple more pages in the section inshallah um and but so we're going to turn it back over to city I mean uh for questions if there are any Sidi, assalamualaikum. Alhamdulillah. Once again, it was very informative, uh, very uh, knowledgeable and insightful. Uh, yes, we do have um, a few questions here. So, this, let me put it to you. So, the first question, um, I think this one, a lot of my friends, you know, like, they, they've they had, uh, you know, bad perception of Tarika and all that, but you know, recently through the Dawa of Sawilahi and everything, you know, when they see, you know, when we share more about the reality of Tarika and what is it about, you know, they they come to understand, you know, this this is fine and everything. But then they have this question: Can I, you know, can I walk on the spiritual path or can I attain Marifa uh, without taking on a Tarika or without having a she? Is it compulsory for me to have? Okay, so. Um... <clears throat> The first is that um, uh, Sheikh Hamid Zijani said that the, these sciences, Ma'rifa and um, knowledge of Allah is something that is provided to people by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that the first thing is that, and that is Allah is who provides it and he provides it to whom he wills. Um, the second is, is is it likely? So it's, it's possible, you know, if someone is, is exceptional in their practice of the, of the religion and their sincerity and their purity, then it's possible that Allah will give them a'rifa without tariqah. This is possible. We can't, you know, we can't limit the mercy of Allah because this is all in the hands of Allah. However, is it likely? No. And, and so Sheikh Ahmed Zijani, he said that this ma'rifa, this madad, uh, this, the, this providence for the people of the spiritual path, Allah decreed that in every age, it will come on the people of special permission who are, who are among the perfect Gnostics, the perfect Adifim. And so um, it's possible, but it's improbable in the safest path is to look for somebody who is a perfect Arif who can help you to attain that. And that's the safest and shortest path, you know, uh, because we don't deal with what's possible. Like, for example, um, uh, Allah, Allah says in the Quran, you know, don't, um, Allah forgive, doesn't forgive, you know, shirk that somebody should, should, set up par partners for Allah, but he forgives beyond that. He forgives whoever, to whoever, whoever, whomever he wills. And so we don't take this ayat and say, oh, so I'm going to do whatever I want because it's possible that Allah can forgive me. No, we take the most likely and we try to stay away from everything that would bring Allah's wrath. And then we you know, seek his forgiveness if we slip. But we don't just take this as a, a, a um, you know, a, a license of sort to just do whatever we want. The same with tariqa, the same with ma'rifa. Yes, it is possible. You know, Allah places his, his mercy wherever he wills. So it is very possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can put his, his ma'rifa in someone without the traditional means. But it is more likely if we take the traditional means and we seek out one of his, one of the perfect Arifin and in their path. Okay. Thank you, uh, Imam Talud. 
Um, okay, so the next question is, um, you mentioned that if we apply the knowledge that we know, then Allah will teach us that we do not know. So is this what the Sufis say that Allah becomes a teacher? And how do we, how do you advise we keep to this practice? So, yes, that, that is what the Sufis, that the, the Allah becomes the teacher. Uh, but that is an advanced uh, person on the path. Okay. And so um, you need a guide. And it's very possible that Allah becomes a teacher. He, he, you, you know, if you act upon your, 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 um, your basics and, and keep to the Sharia, and then you, you know, especially if you have awrad from the Shiyukh al-Tariqah, and you do your awrad, then you may read the Quran and get an understanding, or you may read a hadith and get an understanding that is different to what they taught you in the school. Yeah, this is this is possible. However, you need a guide to tell you, okay, no, this is not correct. You know, someone who has already traversed the path to tell you, okay, this understanding, you know, that came to you is not correct, or this understanding is correct, or okay, yes, you're correct, but it's better to do it to say it this way, or it's better to understand it this way. So in order to to become somebody who Allah teaches, you have to first gain understanding from somebody who has traversed the path of how to recognize what is genuine and what is not. Okay. Well, it really uh, clears the doubt, I think, Imam. Um, okay, so when we see people who have um, completed tarbiya or you know people who say that they have marifa behave in ways that are not mindful of people in terms of like exerting the power or you know like hurting people how do we come to terms with that okay first um the idea that you complete tarbiya is completely wrong Okay. There, there is a, there is a, you know, especially in the Tariqa Tijaniya, especially in the, uh, the Zizla of Sheikh Ibrahim Niaz, there is a certain method that you go through and, you know, and that particular process ends, but you can't stop, stop your Tarabiya there. You have to keep going and you have to keep going. And how do you keep going? You keep in touch with the Sheikh, you keep keep on your awrah that, that the Sheikh gave you for the tarabiya, and you continue to do it and you continue to move towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise you can't, you know, you can't, there's no such thing as I stop my tarabiya. Tarabiya is life, you know, and there's always something, something to learn, you know? And so, uh, that, that's the first thing is, uh, when somebody says they completed tarabiya, they completed the first, pro the first process. And uh, when, I, when I first went through that process with Sheikh Mahi, um, you know, I called him and, I, and you know, we finished and, and I called him and I said, you know, I feel like this is just the first step. It was the, and I had completed all of these things with him and I had done many things with him and, and I continue to do th many things to them. I, I, I tell him, you know, this is, I feel like this is the first step. And he said, yes, you know, this, this is what many people don't understand is that you, when you complete this process, you have only taken the first step. You're still a beginner and you have so far to go. And so we, we have to um, get rid of this understanding that Tarabiya is a process that ends. It's not a process that ends. It, it ends with, with you being a perfect knower of Allah and in his presence at all time and perfectly obedient. Until you reach that, then, then there's no, I completed Tarabiya. Secondly, uh, when people that are advanced on the path do things um, or they completed certain things before us, they do things that should not discourage us. However, we should not take them as role models and we should not take them as people who are 
Arifin as such. Why? Because Shaykh Ibrahim who said, he said that the fat, the illumination, is a breeze that lifts the the uh, the murid up and carries him into the divine presence. If he has taqwa, if he observes taqwa, then it remains. If not, he becomes as a person who experienced something like he had a dream. He experienced something, but he all that, all that's left is a memory. And so, if the person is not acting upon taqwa, then we can't call them arifin. Okay. We don't disrespect them, and if they are went further than us then we have to understand that maybe Allah is putting them through something, you know, and they will be back and we make dua for them. But at, at the same time, we don't take them as role models or consider them to be, you know, the Arifin. So is it still okay, like we have uh, desires or wish to, you know, I want to finish my tarbiyah, is still okay for us to have that wish or we shouldn't like we should just wait for whatever happens to us or receive um the the wish should be to know allah not okay. to finish tarabiyah the wish to be the the desire and the objective is to know allah and so that should be your goal and on the path you will get to a point where you realize that you will never completely know allah but you keep trying to know him more and more because that increases you and your love and your closeness to him and it increases you and your and your ibadah and so you you try to know him and that should be the goal is to know allah not to finish tarabiyah because this is not you know like i said this is tarabiyah is till you die <laughs> okay alhamdulillah yeah no. So now the next question, uh, I think it's very similar to whatever we've been um, discussing now. Um, is having Ma'rifa more to perfection of our character or is it more to us knowing the Maqamat and Asra? So knowing the Maqam and, uh, and Asra and things like this are called Ma'arif. It's not Ma'rifa. Ma'arif. They're, they're called like sciences or knowledge or, or different types of knowledge okay. on the path. Marifa, as Sheikh Ahmed Tijani who said, Marifa, perfect Marifa, is that you know all of the, the, all of the degrees of creation and all of the degrees of the real, of, of the truth, and that you give each degree its proper due. This is perfect ma'rifa. And so this is this is what we, we seek when we want, we say we want ma'rifa. But the, knowing the different secrets and things like that, you know, if it increases your ibadah, it's good. If it doesn't increase your ibadah, then it may be a test for you. So we don't want knowledge that, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu would seek refuge in Allah from knowledge that does not benefit. And so, and that goes for knowledge of, of secrets. These the secrets that that are revealed to you during process of tarabiyah or during sohba with the sheikh and stuff like that. If it does not increase you in your ibadah, you can't focus on it because it's not, it, it may be a test for you. So it, uh, the, the ma'rifah is to know these degrees and to give each degree its proper due. That's what we should be seeking. And that is, you know, do you give the degree of divinity, uluhiya, it's proper due. You give the degree of rububiya, of lordship, it's proper due. You give the degree of, of the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's proper due. You give, you know, your neighbor his proper due. You give your Muslim brother his proper due. You give your sahib, your, your, um, your companion on the path, his proper due. And you know all of these things and you give everybody um, so the, the, the saying is that he gives everyone who has a right his proper due that is ma'rifa and in ma'arif these things you know they, they are helpful in as much as they keep us going towards Allah 
if they don't keep us going towards a lot, then they may become a distraction. Um, one of the question is very close to whatever you were touching on, but I just let me just share with you in case you want to add on something. Um, if, what is the difference um, in degree between like, you know, we're reading uh, the books uh, of Shebra Mias or, you know, the books re that relates to us about Marifa, about the Tarika and everything. What's the difference between or reading about Marifa from books to being it revealed to us, the degree um, in terms? Um, the difference is, is that so first, uh, we have to understand that uh, from reading these books, you know, this may uh, open the doors for us, for Marifa. You know, reading the books of Sheikh Ibrahim Niaz, reading Jawad and Ma'ani, um, which we have uh, just published, alhamdulillah, uh, the first volume. Um, reading these books, the, these books help us to move along the path toward, towards Ma'arifa, you know, through through making our love and our dedication to the shuyukh um, sincere. But Ma'arifa, like the, the knowledge that we seek is what comes as a divine gift. Not, you know, through reading books and trying to think about what they're saying because in reality, what, what the, the shuyukh put put down in books is called remote uh, it's called rams it's called symbolism it's not you know it's not really it, what they're saying can't be taken as literal it's a symbol of a reality that they they have experienced and tried to put on put on paper to arouse the desire of the murid and so this is this is the the, the benefit of reading those books but at the same time, we have to do our our work in order to gain the benefits, of, you know, of uh, of of divine knowledge. You know, our work is the awrad and and the things that our sheikh gives us. So with that, right? Um, is it bad adab for us to ask our sheikh to how we can progress in our tarbiyah more or something like that? Because you mentioned also like we should we should uh, desire to know Allah and not to complete our tarbiyah. Yeah, but so completing tarbiyah and advancing in tarbiyah is two different things. Okay. So if you want to advance in tarbiyah and advance in your knowledge of Allah, then you should definitely speak to your sheikh okay. and ask him, you know, and be completely honest about your situation and ask him what's the best way to progress, you okay. know. Uh, but before talking to the Sheikh, my main um, advice, and this is to myself also, is to make sure that we are doing everything that the Sheikh has given us. So we are doing the prayers on time. We are fasting with the proper etiquette we are doing the awrad on time, all of them, not just weird, you know, because some of us, we, we uh, sometimes we get to, to uh, a lazy point and we just want to do weird. You know, we don't do wadifa, we don't do hey, la, la. These, these things we have to do all the awrad that the shiuk gave us. And if you are doing all the awrad and you are, you know, adhering to all of the conditions, then you can say, uh, Sheikh, you know, what can I do to, to advance? You know, but mostly, but, but at the same time, the Sheikh may, will most likely tell you, you know, to keep doing what you're doing. Because in reality, this, and this is very important, in reality, our Sheikh and the Zahir, the Sheikh who is, who is teaching us physically, is only teaching us on behalf of Sheikh Ahmed Tijani or on behalf of the, the, the Grand Sheikh of his Tariqa. And the Grand Sheikh is only teaching on behalf of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is teaching on behalf of Allah. 
And Allah is the true Murabbi. And Allah is the true, you know, person that does the, he's the only one that does start a beer in, in reality. And so we, our advance, yes, it, it's part of it is our effort. And part of it is what Allah decides. So, um, yes, yeah, you should want to advance, but not, not in the way of wanting to see things or wanting to have fat and things like this. Uh, because Shaykh Ibrahim, the Aswad, the Allah, he said, you know, it is bad adab for the murid to, to, to expect fat tomorrow or in a few days. And that, you know, if you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, all your life without having fat, then you still had the benefit of worshiping Allah and you have not lost anything. And so we have to keep that in mind. But at the same time, you can ask your shaykh, if, you know, how to advance, you know, with, and your intention with advancing should be to become a, a more perfect slave of Allah. That, that is our intention. You know, that, and that, that is the purpose of Ma'rifa. Ma'rifa is not to become, you know, somebody known as an Arif. It's not for these things. It's not for, um, it's not to know it and, and try and feel good about yourself. Ma'rifa is to become a more perfect slave of Allah, which is to give everybody who has a right their proper due. Okay. Um, okay. Let me just finish with one last question. Um, in terms of uh, Ma'rifah, um, what is the role of uh, Khidma in, um, for us to, like, what, uh, what will you advise someone who's on the path of uh, Ma'rifah uh, in terms of Khidma? Um, I mean, Khidma is important from a, a standpoint of the Tariqah. Okay. And so, um, but Khidma, it, it it has different levels, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you have you do khidma to your fellow murids, you know, and that should be a little bit different than the khidma that you do to muqaddams that your sheikh has has uh, mm -hmm. appointed. And then you should also do khidma to your sheikh, and that should be your khidma to your sheikh should be more of a priority, and that can be anything that he has he has tried to get you to do or anything that he has told the jamaat to do this is khidma and this is and khidma is a big door um actually it's a very big door you know um the reason that you know um the city city ali cc was you know granted the station that he was and he was shaykh ibrahim he was his, his khalifa you know, um, and this is because of his khidmat to Shaykh Ibrahim, brother Lawan. You know, um, and and the attitude of a of somebody who does khidma is what he told Shaykh Hassan, brother Lawan. When Shaykh Hassan asked him, he said, "Do you think one day we will get paid for the work that we're doing on the on the farm, um, on you know Shaykh Ibrahim's farm?" And you know, Sidi Ali said, "You know, who told you that we're going to we're going to get paid? You know, we, you know, we work because I don't, you know, I don't know anywhere where a man cannot cannot work and you know get what he wants. And so, you know, th this is the attitude of the Kadim, is that you know, it's not about you know the the accolades or getting getting rewards in this world. He does service." To, to the people that deserve service. You know, so it's important um, and it will ease the path through making one more sincere to his sheikh and making the sheikh turn his attention more towards, towards him. And when the, ter the sheikh turns his attention more towards you, then there's ma more madad, more uh, spiritual assistance that comes your way. Uh, thanks a lot, Imam uh, Talud. I think uh, it was very, we had a lot of interesting questions um, today, and we've covered all of them, thanks to you. Um, I think today we are good, and we we can close today's session with your dua, alhamdulillah. Okay.
قل هو الله احد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا احد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل اعوذ برب الفلق من شر ما خلق ومن شر غاسق اذا وقب ومن شر النفاثات في العقد ومن شر حاسد اذا حسد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل اعوذ برب الناس مالك الناس اله الناس من شر الوسواس الخناس الذي يوسوس في صدور الناس من الجنة والناس Allah we ask you by the uh, love that you have for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and by the love that we have for your people we ask you to guide us upon the path that lead towards towards guidance and to guide us upon the path that lead towards knowledge of you and towards being more perfect servants to you and to your people and we ask you you know to outpour on us the the, the oceans of mercy and of grace you know for because you, when you give grace then it, there's no one to say from where is this no it is the fadl of allah it is the grace of allah and allah gives it to whoever he wills wa sallallahu ta'ala ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam subhana rabbika rabbil izati amma yasifun wa salamu ala al mursalin wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Alhamdulillah. Uh, thanks a lot, Imam Talud. Uh, inshallah, we will uh, catch you again next week. And inshallah. from Singapore, we wish you and all the Muslims of Mexico also Ramadan Mubarak. Thank you. Ramadan Kareem. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, guys. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we just finished um, the fourth episode. Uh, yeah. Uh, fourth um, episode of knowing the path to Allah. Um, so before I end this um, live session, let me just share with you um, some announcements that I would like to make. Uh, you can also find these announcements in the comment section. So um, for this blessed month of Ramadan, uh, we in Suilahi are partnering with Free Food for All to bring our porridge and uh, cook meals um, to those who are in need and we are aiming to raise $60,000 so that we can secure 25,000 meals uh, this month. You know, this is a more difficult month for a lot of us because we, um, because of the current pandemic and you know, in Ramadan, a lot of us we will be able to eat in mosques and stuff and which we don't have the benefit now also because this pandemic. So I hope um, every one of us can um, come in together and to help those who are in need through this amazing um, uh, organization, Free Food for All. So you can go to the link in the comments, um, bit.ly uh, slash porridge meals or WhatsApp us at 8769-3947 to find out how you can be part of this project. Um, And secondly, uh, tonight we will be having another live session with Sheikh Mahi on uh, becoming the knower of Allah in uh, Ramadan. So it will be at 10 p.m. Uh, so please tune in. It will be going to be uh, very insightful. Sheikh Mahi is an um, is a Murabi with a lot of has been guiding. A lot of us in the in the path to Allah, including um, our speaker earlier, Imam Talu Dawood. So it's going to be very informative. There will also be a question and answer session, and uh, the last but not least, uh, a project, uh, another project for humanity that is being uh, led by Sheikh Mahi, is the build a hospital in Senegal project. So, as you all know, we are we all are. Uh, in we have been doing this project for the last three years so we have the link in also in the comments so you can go in and check out read more about uh, this project and uh, and do what you can in this month um, we all sh uh, should do our best to increase in whatever ways we can give back um, it's okay even if it's the if we feel like it's a small amount uh, inside of Allah is never small So inshallah, I hope we can uh, help one another um, this month to make our lives uh, more easier and better. So with that, I would like to close this live session. Thank you everyone for tuning in. 
Um, so I hope to see you again um, next week, but also tune in uh, later tonight. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum.